chocolate, so bear with me, I guess. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's really good, and we'll finish up to quarter of six, 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 and get a run out. Okay, all right. Hello, everyone. So, like Tony said, um, I'm an ICU registrar at the Western Hospital. Um, I was actually here for three years as a surgical resident, so I know where you guys are coming from. Um, I am a little bit grumpy from night shift, so if that don't make sense, just put your hand up. Okay? So today we're going to talk about cardiac rest um, for the first half, and the second half we'll talk about post-cardiac rest here. So what we end up doing in ICU. Um, quick show of hands, how many of you guys have been in a full-on code blue cardiac rest situation? Yes. Yeah, not bad, not bad. Look at my surprise. It's not the most common thing. Um, it's actually unusual, but you're meant to be as good as possible as if that's what you do every day. We are in. Okay. I'm going to send just one slide on this because it's very boring and very primary exams. But I'm actually as many questions. You've probably covered this at some point. Cardiac rest. Why do we need a heart? To deliver oxygen, you say. Yes. Oxygen being delivered depends on your cardiac output, but also on other things. So your hemoglobin, your saturation, your lungs are kind of important there. The cardiac output is all dependent on your heart. So your heart needs to work to push that blood flow. Work done by your heart. Cardiac output is dependent on stroke volume, how much blood actually gets through when you pump. And that's all dependent on how much blood you fill in, how much pressure it has to pump again, how strong your heart itself is. So cardiac rest is, in a way, a little bit of holiday for your heart. It does not need to do work. So everybody else, your whole body system is going to shut down, but your heart's going to be pretty happy. Up to a point, because like any organ, it does have basal metabolic rate that you need to provide. So the whole point of resuscitating somebody is to be able to prolong that time until you get to your basal metabolic rate being affected. So keep it going until something else will take over. So, approach to cardiac arrest. I've divided that into four, and that's it's very arbitrary, but it's basically on my own experience. So, what I've where the symptoms are working in clinical practice. Um, we all know ALS, BLS, shockable, non shockable, but when you get to a scenario, it's very different. So, I'll tell you what I mean as we go through initiation phase. A lot of the scenarios that you'll get uh, in medical school, or even when you're starting to break and you're practicing your ALS, will be. You arrive at the scene and CPR has been and gone. Guess what? This is not true. A lot of the time, you're the first person there. And you have to decide if this is a cardiac arrest or not. You have to decide if you want to start CPR. And you obviously have to call for help. So I think we all know Dr. ABCD for calling for help pretty early on. But then once the help comes, what do you do? There's so many people. A lot of times there's this massive crowd of people and you're going, well, I didn't realize you could be the war nurse or you could be the anesthetic consultant who could give me a heal in five seconds. So the main thing as soon as you get there is knowing who are your people, who is your team. And I'll explain that a little bit more later on, but pretty much there's about eight different roles. A lot of times you're not gonna have eight people, especially in a country hospital. You'll have two, and I'll be you and the nurse who was there initially, not you. Um, making the decision to start CPR. You'd think that would be quite easy. It hasn't been. It hasn't been. Um, in ICU especially, we've got fancy equipment. And a lot of the time you see the person arrested, but you don't realize they are. They're still having this awesome rhythm. And you see their blood pressure dropping, and you go, I think they're resting, but I'm not sure because I'm already running adrenaline. So very difficult scenario. I'm not going to give you any of that today, but just to keep in mind that it's never as clear as placing your pad and defibrillating. I had a case only a couple of nights ago where we went, okay, I'm going to stop CPR now, we're going to do a rhythm check. There was no defibrillator and there were no pads on, so we ended up resigning CPR. <laughs> anyway, not the time <laughs> Maintainers, um, that's the one we're all talking about. So that's your ELS algorithm. You're going down shockable or non-shockable. Um, not those guys who've been at arrest before, but anybody else. What is non shockable? What's your definition? Anyway, anyway, I'm going to pick. Yes. I'm sorry, go to the computer. Um, Asystole is non shockable. Perfect. Perfect. 
Chocobo's quite easy. It's your VT, your VF, big fat squiggly lines that you have no idea. Should not, probably not be on that monitor. type. VT, VF, very easy. Non Chocobo is actually a system, like you said. Even that is not a straight line like in Grey's Anatomy. It is like this. We all see that and we go, maybe, but no, it's actually not going to work. So you can try chopping, it's not going to work. And the other thing is PEA. Um, PEA is pulseless electrical activity. PEA is any rhythm. It's sinus rhythm. It's SVT. It's a very, very slow sinus bradycardia. How do you differentiate PEA from us normal and breathing? Well, the patient is arrested. Uh, they're not responding to you, and they've tolerated a couple of minutes of CPR already with that rhythm. So that's PEA. So just reinforcing that point a little bit more. Non shockable is, yes, a systole. Everything else in between, that's not VT or VF. Non shockable is difficult, it's got a bad prognosis. Um, a study done last year uh, at the Western, I think, showed that anybody above the age of 80, um, who you get to a code and it's a systole, or even PA, chances of survival is anybody want to take a guess? You can tell it's going to be bad. What do you think is that? What's bad in medical terms? 25%? Oh, you're optimistic, aren't you? <laughs> zero. <No. laughs> anybody over the age of 80 is zero. Um, between 50 and 80, you're a little bit better. You're between 10 and 15, and that's great. That's awesome. That's the best you can get. Um, Unfortunately, it's the most common arrest you get in an in-hospital cardiac arrest is going to be non shockable So, what do you do? We're not shockable so we're down this side. I hope there's a sign. I hope you can see it, but pretty much you've got shockable here, you've got non shockable here. You go down the non shockable algorithm. So, as soon as you see it, you go, okay, no shocks, done that charge, give you adrenaline, start your CPR. Every second cycle, give you adrenaline. Okay? Um, I thought I'd put ROSC here because uh, return of spontaneous circulation, a lot of abbreviating things, uh, means getting the central pulse. Um, all the time it's not easy, uh, especially when you're doing CPR and you feel you've got pulse here. What you're feeling is that distended vein emptying into your heart and coming back up when you're recalling. So, <coughs> not the best. Femoral is a lot easier because you're out of the way of all this drama happening up here. So you're feeling a femoral pulse will be the best you're going to get. A lot of the times, you'll be feeling more on the right side, your friend will be feeling it on the left side. You might not agree. If you don't agree, just restart CPR. The whole point of doing CPR is to minimize time off the chest. And we'll see how that becomes a problem. Because the problem in shockable, so shockable, pretty easy. We're talking about VT, VF, big fat complexes. They can be regular, they can be irregular. So that's exciting when that happens because while you've got your pads already on, um, you shock. Now, one thing that I learned the hard way was uh, when you're doing CPR in a patient, you cannot analyze rhythm because your CPR is causing interference and it looks like VF or VT if your CPR is really regular. Like, it looks like this. And you're not going to shock when somebody's currently on the chest. Okay, This is like one of your most important people doing your CPR. We do not shock them. Okay, it's bad. Very bad. <laughs> so the way to do that is actually, that's coming in the new ALS to guidelines, is using coach the one. So I'll go directly. Um, you're the team leader. You've got airway and you've got the team person there. None of these guys should be leading the code, okay? Because they have very specific tasks and they need to be concentrating on that, especially the team person. You have a normal view and you can see what is happening. It's ultimately your responsibility what happens to your team members. The reason why I'm doing this thing is because last year there were two cases of the CPR person being deeply on the chest and it was simply not being timed. It's a very fine line between uh, minimizing interruptions to CPI and then shock because of the other person. So, C, you turn to your compression person and say, compression is continuing with the MDI icon. All right, oxygen. If you look at the airway person, is the oxygen away? The rather than causing any blames to know. And it's not ideal, but pretty much it's all the way. So, you, you little medical student putting your ID cannula in, get away. Okay. So, everybody gets away. And C. We turn to a 
this when they lose a charge. Now, if you see the video, it's vertically charged. Refresh it and takes about 10 seconds or so to charge. Once the machine is charged, it goes beep, beep, beep. And guess what? When it goes beep, you have this massive urge to just press that button and deliver that charge. So every time the deep machine comes, you will have a CC dose that comes to the light. They are trained specifically to resist that urge to press that button. Alright? So you charge a machine, it goes beep, beep, beep. And you now you need to turn around three and can't do that with CPR. Turn to CPR person and say edge. Hands off. They get off and they say, I am safe. Only then you look at the monitor and just if it's shockable or not shockable. Don't spend it too long. It's probably better to shock than not to shock anyway. But the iPhone's going to be safe. As soon as you shock or not shock, you get straight up onto the chest. Okay? If you haven't shocked, the machine is not alive. So D stands for delivery shock. It also stands for dump the shock. So you decided this is not shockable, you're not going to shock it, you should dump the charge. So this year I started working on the button, and the machine is a little bit different to our edge. The button to dump the charge is a big green button. Yeah. And the button to deliver the charge is a big green button. <laughs> it's not okay. So you can really just say to that different person, dump the charge. And they are close to their machine and they're looking at it and that's their responsibility at that point. It's not as simple as it looks. It's very stressful in those scenarios. And all you can really do is be organized and have practice as well. I just thought I'd put a little caveats here for you. Caveats, caveats. Sync versus non sync sync rhythm have anyone heard of that? Um, briefly. When you're delivering a shock, you can sync it to the person ECGs. In a rest, there is no ECG. Um, we have VA or VT or this word PA, which is obviously not working. So it doesn't matter if you put a VR wave on the T wave and you cause it VT. I mean, that's what you need for. However, if you need in the ED or in cardiology and somebody has gone into a very fast SVT in front of you and you can potentially convert that to a sinus rhythm, then you sync the shock. Very fancy, so I'm not going to go into too much detail with that. Um, a lot of our patients who and you can even see, if you look at it all easy to see the dots, whereas in cases that are more shocking. Um, what do we do if we see those machines on their chest? Does that affect what you do differently? No, it, it shouldn't. Yeah, it's obviously has a worked if they've arrested in spite of that machine. Um, or it has worked. And the shock that it delivered just wasn't strong. Um, so all you can do is put your pads and do what you would normally do. Position of the pads is probably what's important here. Don't put it straight over. The deferred a lot of times actually is here where you want to put your pads. So just put it over. And the teaching is put it at least eight centimeters away from it. A lot of people will go for a lot of like to actually put it anterior and posterior. A lot of populations with T plus A release, and that's not easy to do. So, all you can do is put it as far away from that as you can, but still have an incompetency in the heart between the two parts. Um, Stretching between shockable and non shockable happens very often. It's actually the most common thing that happens. They start with shockable, and then as you start getting worse, they progress to non shockable rhythm. Or if you're starting to get something out of that heart, they go wrong. Non shockable to shockable. Really, it's nothing to stress about. Um, you just follow what the LS algorithm says. You see something that's non shockable, they get irrelevant, start your CPR. You see something that's shockable, you give your shock and you move on. And fine, the next shock might be non shockable, fine, they weren't meant to give a shock anyway. And the second one, oh, that's shockable, give your shock. The point is, don't stress too much. Um, if you've delivered the shock, don't second guess yourself. Don't check for a pulse immediately after you've given the shock because, yes, your heart might have been in a, might suddenly have been jolted away, but it doesn't have the perfusion to actually start breaking. So don't check for a pulse. Check for a pulse every two minutes. Give yourself the best chance. All right. Fancy stuff, people. Who's heard about echo and using echo in a rest? Anybody seen that being used? Good, because we don't do it. Um, it's really, really hard to use echo. Why? Because when you're running to a crow blow, 
all you're really carrying is yourself and your nerves. And that poor CCU nurse is carrying the whole crash card there. You don't have time to drag that echo across. And echo is not going to be available at the moment. ICU is different. Operating theater is different. Um, you have some kind of an ultrasound that gets shot out and have a look at Accessibility is a huge issue. But it's very useful. Uh, we'll go for this in a moment. But in terms of reversible causes, a lot of them are really hard to pick up. Um, Tamponade, you've heard of the big Bex triad? Yeah, what's Bex triad again? Any idea? Hypervention. Yeah. Brain stability. Mm -hmm. Okay. Hypertension. Well, they're PEA. They don't have a blood pressure. Tick. Raised JVP, well, the heart hasn't been pumping for a while, so blood's kind of accumulated there. Tick. Not for a I guess you guys are very loud during this curve. Tick. Everybody's got temper now. That's the cause of every single arrest in the hospital. Obviously, it isn't. It's very, very hard to pick up. And a lot of the time, once you've gone down your reversible causes, that's what's left. This is probably one of the only ways to be able to actually differentiate this temper or not. This is to put a probe. Um, where do you put that probe? The echo views are here, here, um, apical views, um, long axis views, and here, intercostal views, subcostal. You look over here. Not going to happen. Uh, CPR is happening. Not going to happen. The pads are there. Yes, probably the only place you'd be able to shut it in. Um, but even then, there's such a big, big fancy thing happening up there. Even putting that probe down there is going to be really hard. Um, but again, if you see something like that, well, you hope your answer. Um, this is the whole reason for the, for the arrest. Um, I've only seen it in trauma scenarios when we've seen this, but even then, I mean, you don't put the needle in there because it's very dangerous. It's very hard to aim with you're having your probe there and your needle there and it's jumping up and down. So a lot of the trauma scenarios we actually don't even attend that. We just stop CPR. I know it's against everything you've learned from ALS, we stop CPR. And we drew up this formula for our economy, we open up and we free up the chest. Uh, I've only seen it once and it's horrible. You do not want to get to that stage. Now that I scared you enough. Mm. <laughs> oh well. Uh, fancy stuff. Who's heard about these fancy things? I've only seen them in the last couple of years. Um, lupus machines, balloon pumps, and ECMO. In very fancy words. You see your cardiac and ICU registrars all on top of it, but we don't even know what's going on. Anybody have this? No? No? Let's go for them because they're very cool. Look, this machine is this lady here. I had a great video, but it doesn't work on this. So pretty much, um, you've got this thing connected through this tubing here that goes up and down your chest. These are straps, and that's a little board that you put underneath them. You tie their hands up to these straps here, so they're not they're out of the way. You put a little strap around their neck, and you tie it forward to that machine again. The whole point is to not let that machine move down, so it starts compressing your stomach rather than your heart. Um, we don't use it all the time. Um, it's very rare you see what's going. If you do placements in ambulances, there will have those paramedics violence. Why? Because it's very hard to do CPR when you're on the roof, when you're transporting simply from the ambulance down to the ED bay. So they will arrive in recess with that on. Um, but it's very rare that you'll actually have to put it on. The other place I've seen it is, is in the cataract. Um, Cath Lab, if you've ever been in there, it's got this big uh, x ray machine. Everybody's wearing lead, it's very heavy. Table's really tall. So trying to climb up to that CPR is very hard. So every single person who goes to Cath Lab has that board already put under them. So in case they arrest, you can connect that one. I personally had to hold this for the first time a couple of weeks ago. It is heavy, it's ridiculous. And the ad, look it up on YouTube, says, oh, it comes in a very convenient backpack. Mm. There's no hospital or HNS rules in the world that would let you carry that backpack. <laughs> Two people, minimum. And even then, opening that, connecting, because this is actually separate from this thing, connecting that, taking it, putting it is not easy. Um, so in my arrest in Cap Lab a couple of weeks ago, when I need to do CPR, and I saw the cardiac tech wave walking away and went, where are you going, big man? This is your job and come back. Uh, but yeah, he went to actually fetch this. Um, and he was, yeah, he was very tall, very big, and he would carry that massive thing and shut it on and stuff in it. So these are very special cases that I'm, that I'm actually using. Very cool. Very, very cool. 
All right, balloon pumps. Um, oh, you know, I just love them. We kind of um, they have to use. I have to use my brain. Um, basically, um, they inflate in diastole, so when your heart is um, relaxing. So your heart has just pumped a whole heap of blood into that aorta, right? And that's like, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna relax for a second. Um, this machine completely inflates. Whatever heart is there, or sorry, whatever blood is there, is going down to your vessels. Whatever heart is in between that pump, aorta, and your heart, is pushing back into the heart. But there's a valve there, so it's not actually pushing heart into, putting blood into the heart, sorry. It's pushing that blood into your coronary vessels. So it's increasing the perfusion of that myocardium. So it's really good. It's helping to perfuse the rest of your body. It's helping to perfuse your heart. That is already vulnerable. First bit. Second bit, systole. Heart is pumping. It suddenly deflates. And the heart goes, what? I thought there was this massive pressure in front of me. And as soon as I start to pump, it deflates. Oh, I don't actually have to do that much for it. It's okay. It's all right. I can dress it. So very good for the heart, very good for the peripheries. Big problem. How does a machine know that we are in diastole or we are in systole? Well, if you're in ICU and you've got retransplant in circulation and you've got a great ECG, well, it's easy. Uh, QRI is complex means it's systole. So fine, we'll deflate. T waves means it's diastole. We'll end up. In a rest, again, we do not have that. Um, VTVF, impossible. Is this really never going to happen? Um, if you manage to put it in such an acute situation, and the only time again I've seen this put in acutely is in a cath lab situation, um, you only have to hope that your compressions are regular enough that instead of being matched to your ECG, it can be matched to the pressure changes. It's so very fancy, very hard to use. So if we have one of these in the intensive care department and they are rest, we actually turn it off. Because matching that to good compressions without a Lucas machine is very hard. And what you can end up doing is causing a lot more harm, getting it inflating when your heart is actually being pumped or pushing on the heart. Like you just don't want that to happen. All right. ECMO. ECMO is a very fancy word. Extracorporeal membrane oxygenation, we love it. Don't really know if it changes outcome. Um, the ECMO center here in Melbourne is at the Alfred Hospital. And what they do is that they put massive, massive cannulas, which will be like, you know, gauge eight, uh, in your femoral artery or femoral veins, bilateral femoral veins. It's pretty much going on the pump. So you're going, you've arrested, that's fine. I'm going to take the blood away, I'm going to pump it, oxygenate it, pump it, and return it back to you. You don't have to work, you can just relax, and I'll do all the work for you. The problem is, it's a huge as machine. Um, it's very difficult to set up. The risk of actually putting that cannula in your femoral artery and your femoral vein is a big risk of dissection. Um, we had a cryothoracic reg here a couple of years ago, and he knew someone who worked at the art bed. And a lot of his work was in the middle of the night to go and recover vascular as well to repair the femoral arteries in the middle of the night. Um, when you put the cannula, but it's such massive cannula, it's probably just stepping up. So that, that was, it's a huge risk to actually do it. Whether it changes outcome is still not true. Um, we don't know if it does any difference. Um, to be fair, we don't know if the balloon pump does any difference. Actually, on that note, we don't know if adrenaline does any difference because no one's done the randomized control study. It's not like we're not going to take out. So on that note, we're still using it. But we're using it only if there's a plan. Um, fine, I'll put you on ECMO, but you're going for an acute carriage. All right, we're going to revascularize. We're going to fix the cause for it. Or I put you on ECMO. I know you've got horrible congenital heart disease. You are 45, so you're within the age for heart transplant. Let's do that. You can temporize that person on ECMO until something happens, but it's not deadly to match it. No, no, no. Okay, because the risk is way too big. All right, we finally get to diagnosis. God. So four etches and four T's, and the smarty pants for the year we realize that I put five etches and five T's. Is the first picture that came up on Google on Um Normally, hydrogen ion and hyperkalemia is put as one. It's just any changes in electrolyte abnormalities. Um, and thrombosis, uh, pulmonary coronary is one. 
that's how you get the four inches and four inches. Really, all it needs is do an x ray, get some blood, continue CPR until the blood comes back. That's really you can do. If you got an echo, good on you. You can look for that elusive tamponade or tension pneumothorax. If it's very clear they've taken toxins, that will be when they first come in. It's very hard to do that. Very, very hard. Um, the only one I know about was, um, wasn't even doing much, somebody who had taken an overdose of baclofen. Baclofen makes you look plain dead. And it arrests your heart. And he had really horrible kidneys, so he wasn't eliminating the baclofen. So it was just knowing that he had taken it, that we didn't go. His brain damage just stopped. That's the only reason. Um, we kept on going. Just put an ECMO on the whole deal, and it got better. 48 hours later. So this is very hard to take, and you barely ever know. Um, hypoxia, one of the reasons why your doctor ABCD has an A and a B, to get the oxygen out. Hypermolemia, almost all of you, when you'll be in a rest situation, you will be that person putting that cannula in the code. Uh, to give fluid for hypermolemia. And guess what? When you get there, it's always that 22 gauge cannula that has stopped working only two seconds ago as I got onto the chest. So guess what? You always, always will be putting that cannula. It's hilarious what happens. Hypothermia, I'll touch on very cool. Um, so diagnosis would be the next one. So can you already see how this is becoming very hard? Um, you, the leader, have shown up there on that ward, that foreign ward. You know nothing about it. You don't know who you're working with. Um, you're having to get people, tell people to get access, get the defibrillator going, um, get the drugs ready because you're going to have to give a drug and run the urine. Um, switch between the CPR people because they're going to get tired. We already know after more than one minute of CPR, their quality decreases. So keep an eye out for that. Make the whole team work together. Try not to shock that CPR person. And oh, can you please find out what's wrong with them as well? It's almost impossible. So a lot of times when I go to carries, all I can really do is leave the coach and I turn to the medical registrar and go, figure out what's wrong with the patient. I, I will run this or I'll tell the timekeeper, like, tell me what I need to be doing and think about everything else. And the poor man will be there going green for the edges and it's and to the green. It's not that, it's not that, it's not that. Why is that important? For prognosis. Um, how long do you keep a code going? Um, short answer is no one knows. The ALS guidelines say if you've been going for a while, you've eliminated all the possible causes. If everybody's happy you stop, that's when you stop. It doesn't happen like that in real life because you've got a leader. You're the person doing the job. You have no idea what's been happening in the last 40 minutes. How can you make a decision? Um, sometimes decision is made for you. Um, so, for example, pulmonary emboli. If there's a very high index of suspicion it was pulmonary emboli, you give therapeutic plexate during the code. And you continue CPR for the next hour. You just have to because you break the clot. So, you stop doing that. Toxins. Local anesthetic toxicity is an interesting one. You can give something called, um, it's a lipid emulsion. So, you know, it sucks up all the local anesthetic that may have gone accidentally into your blood. But, again, it takes an hour to work. And you need to continue CPR so that that lipid can go everywhere in your blood and mop up all that local anesthetic. As soon as you stop, well, it's just going to diffuse back to your heart and stuff. So you have to go. So in those cases, fine. The decision's made for you. You don't have a choice. But in other cases, you don't know. Um, a couple of nights ago, I had a phone call from the emergency department. And they went, we've been doing CPR on this woman for 40 minutes. Um, we've delivered eight shots in total. Every single time it's BT and VF. You know what? What do you think I should do? Like, she's very old, she's a very poor cool function. I don't see her recovering from this. And I'm on the other end going, Fuck, the chances of this being great doesn't look okay. But look, you're already there. At the next cycle, do a rhythm check. If it's VT, don't jump. If it's PA, hope for ROSC. Hope that the PA is confusing. This is Sicily, don't give it down. Okay, okay. Get a phone call five minutes later. So we stopped to do a rhythm check. It was PEA. It was perfusing. She now has a blood pressure, a heart rate. She's well confused. We have Ross. Okay, sure. But she's going to rest right in the next hour. So fine, send her over to ICU. Well, guess what? She walked out of ICU two days later. We extubated her. She did fantastic. The underlying cause was hyperkalemia. 
high potassium. So we treated the potassium, she got better, she went home. Nothing. So the short answer is we don't know. We can only do the best we can. And it's about gauging the risks of the patient, engaging whether you actually will get something. The important message here, which I probably should have highlighted, is if you get retransplantation circulation, it does not mean neurological recovery. They're two very different things. Um, a lot of the times, you will get them back. You will have them in the ICU on the adrenaline or the balloon pump. Three days have gone by, but they haven't been sedated for two of these days. They actually have just been sitting there. After three days, well, their pupils aren't dilated, but they're doing absolutely nothing. They tolerate all these lines in them, but you're doing nothing. That's when you start to scan their brain and you start having conversations about end of life and they're very difficult. Personally, for these are difficult ones, it's whether you carry it. Where do you send them? Do you need to transfer out? Um, you're going to end up doing raw rotations one day, and transfer out might not be an option because they just will survive the transfer. It's a very difficult decision to make. This is very important. I didn't realize that until I actually started leading the course. That you need to debrief yourself. It's traumatizing behavior. But as a leader, you have to actually take responsibility for what's happening. So I will have my own mentor and I'll have people who support me. But I've walked out of codes before when I've seen the nursing staff stuff just burst into tears, going, I've been looking after Betty for three days. And she just went into a sisterly. Like, what happened? Did I do something wrong? And that's not something you can ignore. Going out in a profession is huge. We all know that. And you need to take care of yourself, but also of each other. So very often, if we have the opportunity, we actually conduct debriefs. Even if it's in the emergency department, if we come back the next night, we'll all sit down and have to talk about it. Because it's just important, because it's going to keep happening. And you're going to have to make yourself and everybody else submit to it. So very difficult. All right. Let's play. Don't worry, I won't be me. I'll be there. I promise. All right. Um, which of you guys final years? No? Okay, second and third years? Great. You're going to be my CPR people. So, <coughs> next year you're going to be in the third. Um, I think it's five southwest, memory, is the medical ward. You're the medical intern. You're the five southwest. You're taking over the morning history. Good blue. CCU. You were there earlier this morning with your consultant, and Iris was there. She's complaining of some form of dizziness. You're not too sure why she's in CCU. Surely she should be on the neuro. What am I doing there? But you realize it's Iris, which is pretty cool. So you run down there, and like every single scenario, the poor CCU nurse is doing CPR. And you rocked up. Your wrench is somewhere unknown. All right, but they're there, they're on the break. Um, I see you coming, I'm sorry. We're super busy, okay? Don't have any time. So it's literally just you. You've got three fellow interns, um, and you've got three really, really good wardens. Really good. They've done this before. So, let's, let's, we'll go in a second. I just want to show you this is a crash card. So you actually get the crash card coming during the code. They've got this awesome machine here, which is a defibrillator, and it will help you actually print ECGs as well. Uh, defibrillator pads, we don't have the awesome handles anymore, I'm sorry guys. It hasn't been around for 20 years, I realized I've passed the that was quite disappointing. Uh, I think I used it once and it was in a third world country. And I was so excited, I was shocked myself and I was off. But anyway, we don't use it for very good reason, like people shock yourself. You're laying your dangling over it. Anyway, that's how it's good pass. Um, and you've got, um, so, the person who comes with this operates a defibrillator. They don't do drugs as well. Find somebody else to do drugs. Um, doing drugs simply means uh, drawing up the adrenaline and drawing up the amiodarone for the second and third shock um, in a shock ball rhythm or for every second shock. Are you surprised how quickly time goes? You've barely drawn up that adrenaline and given it and then given the flush. That they're going, okay, keep adrenaline. You're going, but, but, but. Well, the whole reason it took so long is because it took four minutes to predict anyway. So I still have to give it, but then now I've been excited already. So it's remaining on your toes that whole time. Don't worry, there's nothing to calculate. It's one milligram. Whether it's the small adrenaline vial or the huge adrenaline vial, you've got one milligram. I would just get the huge one and just flush it with as much saline as you possibly can muster in that situation. All right. 
let's do a little exercise. Don't worry, I'm not going to pick on you. I'll pick on anybody who's not making exercise. Um, I'll be a scribe and your timekeeper. Uh, who wants to be my leader? Oh, come on, I'm full of you and I'm saying I'm not going to pick on you. No one? No one? No. Oh, I'm fine. <laughs> <Here we go. laughs> uh, airway. Airway should be. So you come to the curb, right? You've got three interns there, you've got three nurses there. There's an anesthetic bridge coming, I'm really sorry. So one of the interns going to have to do airway. You don't know who anyone is, uh, but you can tell the nurse or nurses because they're wearing really nice robes. Um, you need a couple of people, so you need airway, a couple of CPR persons who are going to rotate. What I mean by access process, I'm going to get uh, Doing drugs, operating the defibrillator. Person to get stuff, I think there's an actual word for it, but I can find it. Uh, in my mind, it's that war nurse that you go, oh my god, we are only having 14 pink cannulas. I think it's one of these in ages, but I'm really good at getting pink cannulas. I want pink cannulas. Is that also a person who just gets stuff magically for you? You have no idea how much that has helped me. Oh my god. So, honey, let's find out what pink I can make that can go with your life. Awesome. What's your question? What's next to me? Perfect. Okay, so I think that um, in, obviously communication is really important when you're starting out in the code. So I think that I would establish roles by asking people whether they're comfortable doing it. So I'd say, are you able to manage the airway? Okay. And then once, I've, once you said yes, then I'd say, okay, can you move to the head of the bed um, and probably start bag masking or inspecting okay. the airway and looking for signs of breathing? Okay, perfect. Um, um, yeah. What do you guys think? Is it better to ask somebody or is it better to tell them? Show of hand, who thinks we should just tell them what to do? Yeah, who thinks we should just ask them? Okay, I don't know if I've got the answer for you on that one. Um, I think it's better, my experience is, as a junior reg is just tell people. Because you get there and it's just a mess. It, it's impossible. All you can really tell is probably who's the anesthetic person, because they were wearing red shoes on them. And they've got a little cap on their head, and you're like, I think your anesthetic goes ahead of it. And normally you just see them gravitating to the head. Like, you don't have to tell them. They're just like, this is my life. <laughs> <laughs> they just get there. But the rest is really hard to organize. Um, so all you can do is say, hi, I'm so and so. I will be leading this code. And for like a fraction of a second, people actually listen to you and care about you. And then it's mayhem again. And you go, okay, you and you will be doing CPR. All right, you and you, if you drink drugs, you know how to operate in DP, you can do that. I've seen people do it different ways. I've seen them go, can you do this? Can you do that? And it works because sometimes you'll have a nurse who's fantastic at cannulating people and she has cannulated iris just this morning, so she's posting this. And instead you get a resident who's been doing well search for most of the year and hasn't really had to cannulate anyone. So asking people, who can give me a cannula? Okay, turning to people kind of directly and say, can you give me a camera? Can you guess where I'm going to move Because if you just have those big comments, they just sit there looking at you each other going, you going to do it? I'm going to do it? And I'm sitting there going, oh my god, I want to do everything. Like, get out of my way. Not, not productive. Anyway, we've got airway person. Can I get two CPR people? You're right there, you're both CPR people. Um, can you be our drugs person? We're all That's okay. Do you want to be CPR? Do you want to be CPR? <laughs> Alright, Tony, I'm giving you to pick drugs, defib, and running person. Okay. Um, drugs, defib, running person. Awesome! Look how easy that was. See how you did that really easily? It's not going to happen. I think we've taken about three minutes. To get to here. So you do not have three minutes, is the, is the point I'm trying to make. Um, okay, so that's the initiation phase. You look for a team, you get people involved. Second, CPR. What do you think of CPR? The ward nurse is doing it at the moment. So do you need to change that? I don't know how much she's doing, been doing it for, but okay. probably would be a good idea. Did you change it? Well, I'd say, how long have you been doing CPR? Yeah. And if she said, I've been here for half an hour, I'd say, it probably stopped. <laughs> I've got two. My point exactly. 
They're exhausted. You need to relieve them. Uh, the question is, do you relieve them as soon as you get there? Or do you re relieve them once you pack on? Because then when you relieve them, you can actually do a quick rhythm check and decide to shock or not to shock. So that would be, it, it's different. I've seen, I've done both actually. Um, the most recent one I've done is that when I've gotten there, a uh, ward nurse is doing CPR, and I've gone, um, one of my nurses went me and I said, can you line up the CPR next? And I just said, well, pads are on, make sure the pads are on first. And then said, we're going to get you off at the next cycle. And I know my nurse really well, and she knew that as soon as I was going to get her, I was going to check the rhythm. But it's about that communication as well, that I'm not going to just get you off and get the one off, I'm going to check part of them as well. So three things in initiation. Finding that team, so difficult. Deciding on CPR, is it adequate? Do you need to switch? When are you going to switch? And do you get it? So when are you going to get it? Whether it's on. This is your rhythm. Who's my addicted person? What do you think that is? Uh, mm, what is relation? I don't know. Uh, okay. Easier. Is it shuffle or non shuffle? I disagree with that. This is shuffle. It could also be non shuffle. <laughs> <laughs> At the end of the day, if you think it's shockable, just shock. Okay, you've got your pads on, you've got the whole team ready to go, shock the victim. Even if it's not shockable, what's the worst it will do? It will do nothing. Um, probably the worst it will do is shock the CPR person, but hopefully you are also not that all over it. So I would just shock them everyone. Um, the whole point is that this is probably going to be the F. It makes no sense. There's no P wave, there's no T wave, it's just nonsense. The other thing that it could be is a sister link and uh, somebody's moving that bed or one of the dots is not connected properly. <laughs> so you're getting that undulating bit of just, just shock, get back onto the chest. It's about making a quick decision and the way I see it is a bridge to CPR. So make that bridge as short as possible so you can get back on that chest and do CPR. Okay? Next one, guys. Who makes this decision that we know Good point. Good point. The leader does. So the DK person is there to charge a machine, to deliver and dump, but only when you tell them. Okay? So that needs to be very, very clear. So that's why we have specially trained CCU nurses. Like um, one of my bosses said that a couple of years earlier, they used to be shock happy, super happy to deliver shock. So they had to be a whole new training program to start them. The point is, you decide. And it's okay if you make a mistake. It's, it's not a problem. Like, what's the worst you would get? Like, can't you rest? What were you doing? Okay. So you deliver the shock. Um, you deliver the shock. What's next? Um, continue CPR. Okay. Uh, one more CPR people again. You too? Great. So you have been doing CPR for a whole one cycle. Mm -hmm. Cycle is two minutes. You're getting tired. Can you do it something like that? Okay, so it's a um, switch and continue CPR. Yeah. So once you've shocked, um, if it has been two minutes, in this case I don't think it has, you can always say, hey, can you line up at the next one? Let's go. But switching here is completely fine by the big ingress and the other one being able to get your cannula. Because one of them is going to get your cannula, aren't you? But there's no cannula, by the way. So you continue CPR. Um, another cycle goes past. You get exactly this at the next cycle. What do we do now? Which one do you think this is? I'll leave you alone. This one goes first. Good. Second cycle. This is the end. What do you want to do? Shock. Good. How much time? Uh, 101 grams. No. No. It, that is true in different situations, but for ALS, it's just just draw it, you don't even think about it, just go. The reason why I'm saying that is because it's impossible to draw somebody's weight. I've been playing this little game with my nurses, and seriously, I always get it wrong. Like, most of the time, I go, they're a little bit heavier than me, and they're being 150 kilos. So, no, I wouldn't trust myself on that. I would just go, draw the wine milligram. Because you just don't have time, you just don't have the brain space. Okay, so where are we now? Good. We've done first shock. 
All right. I would also see PR people have done two more minutes. Shock one more time. Um, after the second shock, CPR people, are we back on the chest or are we checking for rhythm? Tricky. I'm, I'm saying this on purpose. We are back on the chest. Um, why? Because you've shocked. You're shocked. You have, even if it was VT and you shocked it into a rhythm, that heart is not confused. There is no point looking for that pulse. Get back onto your chest. At the next sample, when we do a rhythm check, if it is PA, we'll do a pulse check. Okay? It's a little bit confusing. So where were we guys? So yes, we are also, we did our CPR. We had a tattoo defibrillator. We got a rhythm. And we went shockable. No. Shockable. No. Tremendous rhythm. We've gone around again. This time, however, we get a non-shockable rhythm. What's happened? I think we've switched from shockable to non-shockable kind of way. We shock shock. This time we check, it's actually non-shockable. Hmm. Person who was running around to get stuff. You've been sitting there doing nothing for a while, but you've seen the whole dog. So you've got shock shock. Third one, what happens? It's not shockable. What do you want to do? Perfect. What do you do with the deploy? Nothing. You dump the charge. You dump that charge. That thing is still alive. I'm not saying it would just suddenly like put into a patient or anybody there. All I'm saying is that if you're in a really cramped area and somebody just went, eh, you know, accelerate or whatever that job. So you dump it. So I dump it. Or would you try to try to say? So Tony will go dump the charge and deep his guy is all on top of it and going to dump it. And then, non shockable let's say it was PEA. If it's PEA, so if it's a sinus or a very quick sinus, slow sinus, you check the pulse. That's when you check the pulse. Okay? You have a pulse. This is lost people. Yay! <laughs> If it's a systole, you give the tell that it's gone. Okay? So you switch from a shockable to non shockable pathway in this case. It's, it's not that clear cut. All right. So at this stage, I'm, I'm going to stop it here because I want to show you that we've done three cycles, right? We've done quite a bit. Like we've shocked two times, we've given adrenaline two times, one at the second shock and one at the third rhythm check. Because we went from shockable to shockable, but we're given two drugs. You obviously had access. I know who the access person is, but great job on that. Um, and you actually did CPR, so you did quite a bit. But are you close to getting an airway? Um, have you done anything so far? You've just been holding that bar, like holding on to your VLI and just going one, two, back, one, two. Airway's not secure. Do you need to secure it during the code? Probably not. It's okay. As long as the oxygen is somehow getting through, even just holding that bag over their face, that's okay. You don't even need to do this. As long as you've got that oxygen somehow going down there. It's actually being trained by just doing compressions. You're pressing it to the heart, but you're also pressing that chest. So when you're coming up, it's going, so what it is up there is actually being sucked with negative pressure. So you actually get that oxygen. You don't need to actually do that. It's okay. If you're not doing it, it's all right. But to be fair, that's the only thing you need to do. So just um, check your breath sounds. Oh, hell no. Uh, we've been so busy doing everything else. We don't have time to check this. Plus, do you guys be noisy? Yeah, it's something impossible. So, but that would be your job as the airway person. You've got very good access. You have the head. You're holding your oxygen. A lot of the time, it's useless. Um, I've tried doing it as the airway person, and I've just got can't even reach. Like, it's impossible. Um, D, well, no. Uh, D is checking the disability, so checking for brain function, too early guys, too early. Um, how long are you giving them eight drugs for them to sleep? Nothing, it's way too early. Uh, you can, I normally prefer the person D, just because in my mind, hypoglycemia you know, goes with the faint, so do not forget my glucose, I'll check it here, because that's one of the things you can change and change very quickly. Uh, e is exposure, and uh, it's exposure and it means lines as well. Do we have access? Well, we do have one, but we 
have another touch up pattern. And reverse vocals is having a touch of that. So it's been six minutes. You still don't know what's wrong with the patient. It's okay. And so I've been comfortable with that. A lot of the time, you're going to walk out of there going, I have no idea what happened. Like, and that's when you severe too many go, let's be brief. Like, we lost the patient, fine. Or we got the patient, fine. I have no idea what's going on. And it's about being comfortable with that sense of it's okay not to know. Oh, okay, cool stuff just because you guys are very surgical and I've done trauma before. ALS is a template. How you apply that template depends on the situation. It's not always as clear cut as shockable or non shockable. Uh, I'll tell you an example. Pregnancy is a weird one. Above 20 weeks of pregnancy, although your whole thing is about doing ABCD, within the first five minutes, you need to have opened the abdomen and gotten uh, the baby out. It doesn't happen, but guess what? It's part of ALS. The whole point is to decompress uh, the veins going back to your heart because a big gravid uterus is pressing on it. So by getting the baby out, you're getting the baby better and you're also getting some muscle. But only about 20 weeks. So the, all these little caveats, like they're just really hard. I'm going to touch trauma for a second. Trauma, CPI is not the answer. I know, right? Mind blown. CPI is not the answer. Um, the whole point of trauma is to quickly identify what's going to kill them. The uh, reason why is because you're not dealing with that ATO or with who you think know has cardiac disease. Um, it's been sick for a while. It's been in the cardiology ward for two weeks now. You're not dealing with that one where, yes, 4 inches and 14 are fantastic. You're dealing with that young drug addict who's stolen a car, crashed against a tree. And what's going to kill them there is going to be blood in the thorax. A tamponade. A tamponade is actually up here with some differentials. It's going to be like a brain injury that you can see brain over you. Like, it's very different. So here, airway is crucially important because it's going to kill them very early. If they're going to obstruct the airway, don't even bother doing CPR because there's nothing that's going to fix it. And that's part of trauma. For airway, protect your C-spine. If you think you can't hear breath sounds, you don't just go, this could be a tension. You put the needle in and you decompress it. Uh, same for tamponade. So if you guys know about the EMST course, that's what we teach. It's about doing all this. And once you've done all that, then you can address CPR. It, it's not very out there. And it's simply make sure that CPR doesn't change outcome. Okay. This will actually save them, their life for the CPR at that point. It, it's very different. Um, Hyperthermia. Um, I know we don't have snowmen in Australia, I know that, but you'd be surprised the amount of cases of hyperthermia I've seen. And all the people in their home, um, not paying for electricity because they can't afford it, and they found the next day, they cold. The last one I had was 28 degrees, and um, he arrested, but we kept going. Um, Simply because you're not dead until you're alive, uh, you're warm and dead. But the reason why I say that is because when you cool, your brain is protected. So if, even though that heart hasn't been providing all that oxygen, your brain hasn't been extracting that much oxygen in any way. So you've got a certain degree of neuroprotection, so you have to continue. Warming the patient, crucial. Drugs don't work. You need to warm the patient because the blood is sluggish, it's still not getting there. Shocks do not break. Um, you can try, but they just won't break. They'll just keep being in the air. They actually said there's no point in them delivering the shock unless the patient's about 30 degrees. So, very different scenario, but surprisingly common in Melbourne. Yeah. Okay. Nobody okay? I've been talking for way too long. <laughs> Any questions so far? No. Okay, it's a bit weird and wonderful at the moment. But what I'm trying to show you is that there's more to ALS than the ALS pathway. Okay? And it will become important not when you're medical interns, but when you're doing your ED rotation and you're seeing really wonderful. Does anybody need to get up, loosen their feet? They just sort of get out of here. Okay. Uh, okay. Let's keep going. Keep going? Okay. There's only about 10 minutes or so left. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Too crazy. Let's address post risk here. That's all right. Um, that's what we're doing as a year. Um, 
the immediate post-arrest care is um, what you do as soon as you got involved. You don't just go, all right, high five, good job team, move out. No. You just make sure your ABC is okay. Is your AOA all right? Did you get oxygen through? Do you want to get anything in the airway? So it's you down. Um, do I need CG? Repeat the blood pressure, get an R line. Um, little things. And then you move to ICU. So what we do, guess what we actually do do things sometimes. Um, once they get to us, there's not very much more to do in airway. If they're not intubated, but to be honest, they end up being intubated. Uh, the reason why is because a lot of time we're thinking about what's happening next. Going to a cath lab with somebody who's not intubated is a little bit scary because if they're rest in there, it's very hard to intubate. So we might electively intubate them at that point. Uh, we're thinking about transfer. ARV will not have to be a patient who's not intubated, so simply that. ARV is a doctor who will be for it. If you're calling your country hospital to get their transfer here, they will tell you to intubate or they will get the end of themselves. Uh, the sim simple fact of matter is that intubating in a moving vehicle, again, so a lot of the time we'll end up doing that. Uh, Tachyderm law for those who don't know is a um, dual antiplatelet agent. It's in heart attacks. Once they get to the cath lab and they've actually gotten revascularization, one of the first drugs you give it to make sure they don't have to get to do that. You need an agent. So that would be the other reason. And I put everything else going for that airway. I'll be angry. B. Nothing. Oh, I'm closing in five minutes. If anyone wishes to borrow. If you have your oxygen levels as high as possible, not too high. Um, if you don't physiology, we do the oxygen dissociation curve, that goes like this, where the curves are that little turn. I just learned this the other way. It's called the ICU point. Uh, we aim for stats above 92 because that's where the curve turns sharply down. And that's it. That's all you aim for. You set your ventilator, and this is another session for this, to aim for that. C is probably where the money is. You are not out of danger. Why? Because the cause is probably not fixed by the time they go to ICU. They're coming to you on route to cath lab. So the cause is still there. And they have a big possibility of arresting again. Even if you if it was hyperkalemia and you treated the K, you haven't had time to treat the cause of the high K, which could be this end stage renal failure patient about the high dialysis in three days. So if you don't analyze them, that's gonna happen again. So you put those pads on. That's right. Give the pads on in case you need to just shock them again. Never take them off. Antiorythics, the other things like amiodarone and lignocaine, you can give that as well. But really only if you see that their rhythm is starting to go a little bit weird. Uh, support the blood pressure. A lot of the time your heart is weak. It's just come back on massive shock. There's just so much it won't be able to generate. So you want to kind of squeeze in those vessels, push it towards the brain with whatever it's pumping out. When you squeeze the blood vessels, it's more work for that heart to do. It's already weak. So it's about titrating it so that the heart is happy, the brain is happy too. So hence vasopressors, squeezy drugs, and vasodilators, relaxing drugs. Um, surprisingly, we end up running work at the same time a lot of the time. But we'll run it for, we actually have those called inodilators that dilate the circulation but make the heart pump more. So you actually get a good blood pressure going forward, but well, your heart is also pumping more, so big more work on that. It's, it's a very, very fine line. It's not it's not even and definitely just going to Hypoxic brain injury. Um, we don't see that very much unless you're in ICU. Day three is where we decide. Are you gonna make it or not? A lot of the time they've been in ICU and we've purposefully kept them asleep, as in we've been running for before. And that's kept them completely locked out for the first day. But then you wean their way over before, you can literally nothing. They have no reflexes, they're not coughing or gagging on the tube. You're starting to go in your mind, yeah, they are not you from there. And the thing is, you may have been doing excellent quality CPR for 40 minutes, but that doesn't mean that the neurological outcome is going to be good. It's still a downtime of 40 minutes. And even with the best CPR and the best shocks, the outcome is not great. This was me trying to show you. This is gray, white macro differentiation. Case no differentiation. This is focal. A lot of the time, you will have this everywhere, and it will just be this blob, and you go, well, okay, this is how the brain injury. And they end up dying, which is called brain death, rather than heart death. 
of all the very best seizures, um, quite common uh, in the postpartum arrest, especially if you're in long arrest before getting the retail protein situation. So we don't prophylactically start um, anticonvulsants, but if there's any suspicion of that happening, yeah, we'll load them very quickly with a couple of different medications. Okay, so you may hear a couple of people talking about it, this is probably the only reason I put it there. A lot of people will tell you there's no point in calling the patient. A lot of people will tell you we should call. There's a big TTM study which saying we should call. So calling, what are we doing? We are giving the heart a rest, we're giving the brain a rest. Calling decreases the oxygen we need to make your to make your organ function for this brain or heart. So by decreasing the temperature here, your brain's not going to extract as much oxygen. So you probably will be able to survive a much lower blood pressure. So they're showing that neurological outcome is probably better. They have no idea in whom it works, when it works, how much you should call, when you should rewarm, and how. So it's pretty vague. Um, and there's massive risk with hypothermia. Massive, massive risk. Um, one of them would be coagulation, it's so much worse. You're already giving them heparin to start them from coughing again, but you're cooling them and making all your blood waste. Your heart. Um, rhythms are insane during hypothermia. They keep clicking off with topics because it's so irritable already, and you're pulling them on top of that. It has no idea what's going on. Keeps up with topics, which you do not want. Shivering. Well, shivering is a normal physiological process. It's against cooling. You're pretty much raising your temperature on your own. So if we cool them, we'll end up paralyzing them so they don't shiver. And finally, I haven't put it yet. It increases the uh, the pressure beyond the heart. So, more work for that to do. So, look, the jury's still out. Uh, I know at RMH they don't call, at the Western they don't call. It'll be unit dependent whether they do or not. A lot of times I'll just say, stop them from getting too hot, keep them normal thermic. What's the definition of normal thermic? Probably 36 more times. All right. Prognosis we've spoken about. Uh, a lot of what I end up doing is organization in the end, having a chat to a and going, we've tried our best, we've gone to this point, they're not waking up. We need to consider that this is not going to get set up. And it's very, very difficult discussions that we need to have. A lot of the time, our population is old and they've made that decision already. In the young ones, it's a lot harder. So, to summarize, we're going to catch you guys now. We've gone through the ALS protocol, all right? We've gone from shock of land, not shock of to all of the guys should go about next year. Four H's and four T's. You need to think about those reversible causes. They're not easy to pick, or you can do spot. Knowing how to start the code with your pads, with your team, it's probably just as important as knowing us maybe we should stop, or when should we stop to get the consensus. We talk about weird and wonderful trauma, hypergame, and weird and wonderful stuff like lucas. I'm sure it's going to become a lot more common. Um, right now, it's starting to get. Like, I think by the time you guys graduate, it's going to be a lot more common. And we talk about close fighting breasts, which is pretty much what we do in ICH. It's about keep all the numbers normal and then realize very quickly that to do that, you have to see it too many other measures. Okay, it's a lot to cover in an hour. And very happy to take questions. Yes, and you want the presses. Absolutely. That's so an ICU Yes, uh, we put them in ED as well. I put them on the board. Um, the problem with uh, central lines is that provide an ultrasound, the risk is quite high because you can't see where you go. Um, that said, if you need to run the presses, like adrenaline would be what comes to mind, and you have no other access, just to run it for fun. Um, there are certain presses that can be given very safely, peripherally. Very expensive, so we don't use it. And it's probably one of the main reasons I always switch to social lines when I think I'm high school. Anything else? Is there an argument to increase the adrenaline dose in an arrest for patients who are like morbidly obese? Like, mm, I know what you mean. Yeah. Not really. Um, it's mostly based on protocols at this stage. There's no point of really increasing it. Um, increasing the shock, however, has been an argument in recent years. 150, 150 is what we do. Cardiac, yeah, actually, has a 360, and they only have it in cardiac. And I know he's having a fair 360. Um, 
we have black people everywhere, not only Kaya. Anyway, but just a drawing note, shock, yes. Uh, what else do I have? Anything else? Well, if you think of anything, do let us know. I know this is a little bit far from your surgical, but if you're thinking about critical care and aesthetic pathways, you go from the JCBI, unfortunately. Okay. Thank you. That's all, guys. Thanks, guys. Thank you for the careers night coming up in the fortnight, which is really pretty exciting to just keep an eye out for updates on Facebook. But thanks for coming. Nice to have you all.